Good afternoon or good evening and welcome to the Baltimore Rotterdam Designing Cities webinar series. I am Christina Murphy and I am an assistant professor at the School of Architecture and Planning at Morgan State University and I am an adjunct professor at WAC Virginia Tech. Today, Thijs van Spandonk will uh, moderate this talk, which will be for, um, given by Pavlina Ilieva and David Terhavers presentations. Last week, we spoke about small interventions, large intervention, any type of intervention that have human-centered process-based um, procedures. We reflected on cities that promote international visibilities and competitions for high high-end projects and cities. The same cities that advocate a paranoid critical design approach on that is absolutely important to be iconic. And we discuss on other cities that need to be curated from within by designers that believe in transformation done at small scale for the benefit of communities rather than gentrification and anonymity. Designers that state that it is unethical to be involved in projects that will not be um, accepted in one neighborhood. That is a designer I will listen to, would you not? From February to April, we will present nine lectures featuring dynamic conversations among, among the cities of Rotterdam and Baltimore. Specifically, we will hear how design and policy can improve and build environments and provide access to all. Each week, two designers will discuss design topics from a social, spatial, and architectural point of view to, um, about Rotterdam and Baltimore. Through conversations, we will explore if and how the environment is determinant to the failure or success of a project and what that means for the city, the citizens, and their well-being. All we are welcome, all you are welcome to ask questions during this presentation. You can do so by putting your question in the Q&A button, which you find at the bottom of your screen. We will do our utmost best to answer your questions. This afternoon or this evening, moderator is Thijs van Spandonk. Thijs is, is the founder, partner of Bright, an R&D cooperative for urban development and co-founded co uh, with Ge uh, Gerian Streng in 2017. Wright investigates the impact of systems such as energy, food, mobility, and economy on our environment. Wright is a member of the international design collaboration called the Cloud Collective. With Wright, Thijs was co-curator -co of the International Architecture Biennale in Rotterdam in 2020 and 2021, where the role of design was to create models for an energy transition, socially inclusive city. Thijs is currently the head of urban design at the Rotterdam Academy of Architecture and Urban Design. Thijs, welcome. Please turn on your camera and audio and please lead the way. Thank you. Thank you, Christina, for the nice introduction. Um, and uh, it's really a pleasure to be here uh, this evening. As you can hear, I'm not alone in this room. Uh, it's almost dinner time, but um, uh, I think we'll, 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 we'll be fine. Um, it's a pleasure also, also to introduce to uh, tonight's or this afternoon's speakers. Um, first, we'll have uh, Pavlina Ilieva um, from Baltimore. She's uh, the co-founder, I think, of uh, uh, PIKL uh, Studio and was also previously uh, involved in the education on uh, Morgan State University the School of Architecture and Planning, a school that we at the Rotterdam University, uh, sorry, the Rotterdam Academy of Architecture also has uh, uh, a uh, very good collaboration with. Um, before COVID, we actually managed to do uh, every year an exchange of students from Rotterdam to Baltimore and the other way around, which was very, um, uh, very interesting. Um, and uh, so first we're going to hear uh, uh, Pavlina talk about her work and, uh, and, and her process of, of uh, um, her career as an architect. And next we will uh, hear uh, David Taafis. He's a lecturer um, at the Rotterdam University of Applied Scientists, and he's also an urban ge geographer. 
Um, and he will also talk about uh, how he tries to, uh, not as a designer, but as a, a more like a social scientist, try to uh, uh, bring the social aspects of city making into uh, the city making process. Um, so I'm very happy that we have these two speakers here tonight. Uh, we will be talking about, or they will be talking in total about 40 minutes, and afterwards we will have a a discussion of about 20 minutes. So please feel free to join to drop questions in the Q&A. Um, I will already start uh, uh, reading them during the lectures. If you have any questions, please don't wait until the end so we can have a fruitful conversation. Um, I think what's uh, uh, um, important to mention, maybe uh, Christina already mentioned it, uh, is that this, uh, it will be recorded. Um, and also because of the privacy of the, of the attendees, I will uh, read out the questions if there are any from the audience uh, without mentioning the names of the people that are raising the questions. So you will stay anonymous. Um, I think that's it for now. I've, uh, I really would like to give the floor or the screen to, uh, to Pavlina. Uh, so please uh, join us, turn on your camera and, and take over the screen. Hi everybody. And Thank you, Thais, for the introduction and for moderating the session. Um, I look forward as well to seeing David's work too. Um, but before then, um, I'm happy to share some of our work. Um, I am principal and co-founder of um, PIKL Studio. Uh, Kapal, Lian, and I founded the studio about 12 years ago. And today's presentation is a little bit um, about our background and what brought us to Baltimore, um, as well as um, the kind of work we've been lucky to do here and what we've learned about um, the city and city making and the process and continue to learn, in fact, mm. as part of our practice. Um, Kapow and I are not from Baltimore or Rotterdam, uh, but we, this is our, uh, Baltimore is our chosen home. And um, he comes from the high plains of West Texas um, and uh, is son of an immigrant family from Taiwan. And I grew up in Bulgaria, Eastern Europe to very different places, but um, we've developed and found a lot of commonalities along the way in terms of our background um, in the way that we've always uh, been interested and yearned for the urban. Um, and in fact, um, starting very quickly with some of our background as designers. These are snippets of our architectural theses back at college. And um, we were always very interested in um, kind of the city, but a little bit from two different perspectives. On the left is my thesis, really um, dealing with generative design and um, creating space from scratch. And this is way before um, Generative design was really a thing. It was it was a way of really thinking about how we create space and how we understand space and analyze space. And on the right is Kapal's thesis that was um, interested in space, but sort of a little bit more of the found space, the obscure kind of condition that is found in cities. Um, and throughout our academic career, we sort of engaged in the kind of more requisite architectural projects, but we um, also constantly um, got involved in different international competitions that allowed us to really study and look at the world beyond. Um, this is one of our competitions that was the um, earned a finalist award for Metropolis magazine that was um, developing ideas about lower Manhattan and it's kind of more greener livable future. And it's amazing to see that so many years after that, um, a lot of these kind of attitudes or ideas have really transformed uh, that place. Uh, we were also very interested in kind of the social and cultural condition of the virtual. I mean, I need to place this in the early 2000s to give it real context, but we were really interested in this emergence of the kind of the reality show and um, the virtual experience that people create, uh, both to kind of augment their own lives, but also to impact the, the lives around them. So a lot of interesting themes were happening kind of at the beginning of our careers that brought us ultimately um, to kind of live in a big city. Um, we headed east and kind of these are the early 2000s post-graduation uh, and we landed in Baltimore, uh, which was meant to be at the time a temporary um, location for sort of like your first job out of college and it, it ended up 
uh, being the place that we would continue to go back to uh, to live and practice. Um, Baltimore for us was a love at first sight. I think it's fair to say that there was something deeply intriguing about a place that, that showed its urban imperfection uh, in a very authentic fashion. Uh, for the last nearly 20 years that we've been here, we have seen it change and transform very dramatically. And it's given us this whole perception on how it's managed to develop and transform itself even over the last 200 years of its existence. So the little pink square is our location. Um, it's the place of our home and our office is just two doors down where everybody is working today. Here, that's the image from this morning. Um, and it's located in the old historic part of Falls Point. Um, and, you know, just very quickly on the map here is the 20th century downtown and waterfront of the city. And then the 21st century kind of business center and waterfront that's developing um, near us. Um, so, you know, we've been lucky to really continue to see a lot of this transformation. Our own work takes us throughout the city and a lot of its different neighborhoods in different areas and we've become a student of the city through our work um, and um, you know travel to many places including um, the Netherlands to really see similar conditions and bring them home and hopefully help uh, influence some of our work. In those early years uh, of our practice we worked in large firms did some pretty significant work uh, there and we were mentored uh, very strongly by um, architects and designers, but we also had this side gig, which was sort of feeding this interest into the urban. These are some competitions we continue to enter with other colleagues. At the time, Katrina ravaged the New Orleans coast, and there was this whole kind of wave of thinking about cities in a different way, cities that are on water, but are actually having to live with water in a different way. Um, these are ideas that are going to continue to impact us um, as you know global climate continues to shift and change. But this is where we continue to investigate some of these early ideas about urbanity, both on the large scale in terms of systems and how ecology and sort of urban development really started to interact, but also from a typological perspective of like, what are these urban kind of conditions and new urban types that are really suitable for this? Uh, so these are a series of competitions that also placed fi finalists and it gave us sort of like this um, um, almost confidence that we are on the right path, that we are looking at the right things and we are talking about things that people care about. Um, and it kind of solidified our interest into the urban. Um, we took a, a quick detour from sort of the East Coast, like really big thinking to um, to work out West in San Diego for a couple of years. It was, it was almost like a diametrically opposite approach to design, but it was something that we really felt it was needed in order for us to really grow as designers, not only as ones that can envision ideas, but that can actually implement them. And I think it's extremely important um, that one develops those two sides. It's great to have good ideas, but if you don't know exactly how those can come about or even what it takes to uh, deliver an idea, then you know you end up being probably undersold, underselling the ideas or, or perhaps not even um, seeing them come to fruition. So this experience was really helpful um, in the sense that it allowed us um, to really see both the design, but also the build process of it. So a lot of these projects, in fact, most of them were design built and many of them were also um, developer design built. Sebastian Mariscal Studio is one that sort of worked both on design built work, but also kind of in this role of the architect as developer. So it introduced us very early on to this idea of, you know, how how finance and how actually the cost of things influence design. So he used to say, the more you build, the better you design, but then also you build better, you need to design better when you really understand what it takes. Um, we made it a point later on in our career to design in a way where you don't have to sacrifice your ideas at the end, just because the project cannot afford it. So, afford it. so from the very beginning, we're very, um, sensitive and, and very strategic about uh, how we shape the design possibilities of a project with this idea of it actually being realized exactly as intended. Um, so this was also kind of the experience that um, kind of gave us this additional boost of um, 
you know, you'll never be too ready or too experienced to start your own company. There is no perfect formula. There is no go button. And we felt ready to really start to do the work on our own, in our own way and continue to explore what are these different ways in shaping space in the city. So we headed um, back to Baltimore and but sort of on the way there, we did this one other competition that allowed us yet again to reevaluate some of these ideas. It placed this finalist for um, kind of the vision for a uh, off the grid uh, downtown block in, in, in the city of Dallas. And you can tell kind of as compared to the earlier versions, this kind of scheme has a bit more specificity. We were a little bit further along in understanding exactly how some of these ideas of ecology and equity and um, sort of reshaping the urban environment can really start to gel together. Um, and these are the kind of themes that we continue to return to throughout our work. Um, Baltimore was calling us again, this, what, this ended up being the place we call home for both our studio um, and personally. And the next few slides really start to show the beginning of, of our company. And this is Kapow and us on the first day of um, setting up our first office at the ground level of our, of our townhouse, which then migrated a few doors down. But it was really the two of us that started this exploration. We weren't even sure, are we going to be able to stay in business? Can you get two people busy in this town? And it, and it turns out it's, it's not that hard to get two people busy. And uh, we were very fortunate that Baltimore as well embraced this. And a lot of the relationships we built before uh, led us directly to um, some of this really great early work um, and uh, very early collaborations with um, other friends and professionals. This is the Creative Alliance Cafe, the Creative Alliance, um, as things start to reopen, we hope you visit it. It's one of the first projects that we also designed, built, and um, really started to kind of ground our feet into Baltimore. Um, Kapow also um, has had this uh, long interest in film. I deleted a lot of slides though on that subject, but uh, in those early years, he also uh, did a lot of uh, set design work for HBO and, um, and other sort of television and film series that kind of continue to feed that idea of, of process and, um, and uh, shaping space in that particular case in the film screen. Both of us were engaged in, um, in teaching, as, as um, Thais mentioned, uh, at Maryland Institute College of Art. This is Micah and its beginning design pre-college program, um, as well as some fundamental um, kind of design studios. This is some of the work from Morgan State University. Um, that I did, and you can start to see some of these remnants from our own experiences, kind of the generative design, and then um, in this particular case, one of my favorite ones on the left, which is the wearable architecture show that challenged students to sort of use their own bodies as these very first uh, places and spaces for which you design, and those later translated um, to Kind of different pieces of architecture or in the other one on the right hand side this plywood chair built out of a single piece of plywood through a series of folds and, and generative operations like that it was really important for us that we continue to investigate the things that we have been taught to think about and, and really evolve. Uh, and it was an extraordinary experience being able to do it with our students uh, for several years. Um, Kapow and I collaborated on developing the, together with um, the rest of the uh, wonderful faculty at our undergraduate program, um, developing the housing, um, urban housing curriculum at um, the school, which again approached things both kind of on a typological spatial perspective in terms of kind of rethinking existing housing typology just introducing hybrid ones uh, and then applying them throughout the city both uh, by the way both the um, housing program and the beginning design program uh, received national ed architectural education awards we're extraordinarily proud of that and um, we're happy that our students continue to engage with that curriculum this is a quick snippet of our students and one of and kind of the most interesting projects it's, it was extraordinary to see how a lot of these conversations about urban housing about urbanity really energized the students in a way that perhaps just pure architecture and buildings never do. Uh, many of these folks um, are not graduates of prestigious design programs and our colleagues, Ms. Elena Gentles is right there in one of the pictures and is now in our office. Um, and I'm happy to call many of them um, our colleagues now that they're young designers and really uh, pursuing their own work. This is some of our 
urban design studios that similarly um, continued some of our early explorations about um, the city, but it really um, energized their students and really equipped them with this um, attitude uh, that their work can really truly impact cities. Um, this happens to be uh, one of the award-winning submissions from one of our students uh, for um, the Perkins Homes redevelopment, which is one of the active redevelopment sites currently in Baltimore City. We made sure that every project that was brought to school was current, was something that people were thinking and talking about, and that the students were engaged with all of these kind of discussions. So nothing really quite ever stayed in this purely conceptual speculative space. And it was, it was uh, dealing with real spaces, with real people, People with real projects uh, and with uh, real uh, issues to address. Um, this is kind of one of the early points of our studio when it grew beyond the two of us. Several of these folks aren't with us um, anymore, but um, th this was a great time when a lot of Morgan State, Micah, and University of Maryland grads were all working with us, and we still have a steady stream of that and a lot of the beautiful work that they did um, has really impacted Baltimore. And this next segment shows a number of our projects. I wanna kind of, I'll show you a lot of them, but I'm gonna focus just a little bit more on a few um, in terms of really framing the variety of work that we get to do in terms of scales and types, but also the variety of constituencies and types of clients that we really get to work with. As I mentioned earlier, we're extraordinarily um, fortunate to be able to touch all of these different people and projects in meaningful ways. Um, Our House is a project that many of you would be familiar with. Um, it was at the time the largest project our studio had done, and it was uh, a young visionary development group now uh, very well known as Seawall um, that were looking to reshape the um, Remington neighborhood of Baltimore. And this took like a long kind of conversation between uh, them and research about what the space really wanted to be and where it really sh it, it should be and how it should be shaped. The goal here was to create kind of this free egalitarian space where everyone feels welcome, um, that is informal, that doesn't necessarily require seating and service kind of being the, the focus of this, but it's more about community and gathering. On the left here is a little image of what that auto body shop looked like before it was transformed into our house here on the right. But um, it was these themes about the indoor experience kind of extending into the outside and really embracing the city and bringing the city uh, back into uh, the bowels of the space that were really essential and also creating spaces that were really suitable for people young and old and of, of different walks of life. Um, and we take these spaces now for granted, but, you know, back in, you know, a few years ago, there really wasn't a place where you could really take your kids and meet a bunch of your friends and not really worry about anything else other than being together. Uh, the place also hosts a lot of community events. Um, that actually, and that is a private development that really is taking on the role of um, revitalizing and re-energizing a whole neighborhood and kind of using projects like that as anchors to a lot of the other work going on here. So that served as inspiration to one of the more kind of developed areas of Baltimore here in Falls Point and Broadway Market, um, which is part of the old Baltimore public markets uh, system, which is one of the oldest in the country. It's been continuously functioning for over 200 years. Um, and so um, the, this was uh, our renovation for that and working for a um, kind of pseudo non-government organization, but sort of on a property that is owned by the city. And it was a really interesting discussion because of, it involved a lot of the community and involved sort of the mayor's office and the Baltimore Development Corporation and the Baltimore uh, uh, public markets. It was sort of really a collaborative experience between all of these different constituencies, but they, they also had the vision of really transforming the space. And um, let me show you very quickly what it was before. There's a little image here on the left. <laughs> Um, while this was really a historic market, it had really gone through several iterations in life. And when we came on board, it had sat shuttered for over 10 years, and it was already kind of a bricked up, blocked off dark space with no sidewalks, sort of cars parking all the way to the face of it, a large dumpster area that you see right in front with a giant parking lot. And it wasn't a hospitable place for people. And, and it really functioned like that for 10, 15 years as a market of a different kind, something that was sort of trying to mimic more uh, like a, a grocery store out in the middle of a parking lot, more so than an urban marketplace. 
So our goal really was to re-envision that and use some of the things that we've learned on designing the food hall in Remington, um, but really think about what do markets 2.0 really want to do in the city, understanding that while this, you know, let's say 200 years ago was the primary source for food for people, it is no longer that, but it could serve as a major kind of community um, uh, gathering space. Um, and it's important to mention that when important properties like that really go down, it really affects the entire area. So this was an area where a lot of the storefronts were shuttered. There were a couple of major developments happening around it that simply struggled to gain speed because of kind of almost like this rotten little abandoned um, public space um, that wasn't there. And uh, this is a picture of it soon after it opened. Uh, we added sidewalks, we added trees. It's funny, how little do you really need to turn this into a place for people uh, and really a large gathering space outside um, that really helped energize this entire area. Um, and very quickly, the, the rest of our work um, follows um, a anything from small commercial projects to um, kind of uh, community-based nonprofit work, um, as well as some private development when it comes to urban housing. The common theme being transformation. There's like a little picture in the bottom of, left, of this left of the screen here on the left of you know, showing what this space was like when um, it first started. Um, I should mention another sort of angle in our work, and it's uh, kind of, again, bringing some of that work from California that really had this sense of like full control development design build. Our studio also engages in micro development. So these couple of projects showcased here is something that we self performed both in the design and construction side, but also uh, kind of on the development side. These are self funded projects um, in historic neighborhoods. Um, of Baltimore. And uh, what that taught us, again, is how um, different things work <laughs> and sort of a different perspective it gives you when you are your own client, when you're using your own money to really do work. And it taught, it, it continues, to, continues to teach us about uh, what it takes to do, um, you know, other people's work, whether it's a commercial client or a nonprofit entity or a government organization. We, we really cherish these smaller projects because they, they really kind of open our eyes to how kind of the full um, realm of bringing a project to life really works. Um, another project I wanted to uh, share with you is from um, this last recent COVID experience, um, and it was really an extraordinarily coming, uh, you know, place to come together for city and for residents or for designers. This is the Design for Distancing project that was spearheaded by um, the Neighborhood Design Center and the Baltimore Development Corporation. This here in the front left is our mayor. Uh, and it was, it was a program that called for public spaces, um, sometimes portions of streets, sometimes vacant lots like this one, um, to be adapted in rather short terms, two months design build um, as places where people can gather safely amid the COVID pandemic. Um, so this brought to us um, the meadow, uh, which is a space we designed sort of a vacant lot um, that we mowed the grass to, is sort of in these areas of various sizes and gatherings. And uh, we collaborated with a lot of local artists and craftsmen um, in a time where, you know, it was much harder to actually buy something on Amazon than it was to make it yourself, believe it or not, um, in terms of especially these picnic benches and uh, when lumber was really in shortage. Um, and quickly developed the space, we seed bombed um, the whole lot. And by fall, we had beautiful metal flowers everywhere and created the space for gathering um, that was um, used kind of in the whole um, area um, of downtown. Another competition, now more recent, we like sort of checking in with these big ideas about urbanity, ecology, and, and, and architecture, and, and almost like a litmus test for where do we stand currently in our thinking. This is a project for Korea's uh, St. John City Hall. Um, and this is our studio today. We need to update our squad shot. Um, these are just individual pictures of our um, uh, PAKO colleagues uh, and some of the beautiful work they continue to do today. Um, this is urban housing currently in construction. All of these projects are delivering this year. So 
Um, stay tuned, you won't be disappointed. There's some really um, exciting work that is getting built and uh, we'll be happy to share with everybody. Um, this is a, we work on, as I mentioned, different scales. We have a body of work that really do, do, deals with urban installations um, and exhibition work. This is actually a pavilion we designed for one of the new uh, neighborhoods in Baltimore at Port Covington. Uh, and it was also an interesting collaboration between government entities and private developers. It's an example where the developer of the area um, designs and, and, and builds this beautiful park and pavilion. It's the city recreation and parks that end up um, owning it and operating it going forward. Just interesting models of these crossovers. Um, and they're interesting both as a process and conception and the product they deliver, but they also offer really interesting opportunities for other projects and uh, kind of provide this continuity um, in the urban realm. Um, some of our work continues in adapting um, old places for new needs. This is uh, work we do for craftsmen. Um, this is um, uh, Sandtown uh, Furniture Headquarters, both a showroom, but also make space uh, for this company. Um, it's important that we really tell the stories of both the spaces, but also who these people are, what their work is like. Uh, and it's also, again, part machine because it needs to function as a production place, but uh, also be beautiful and welcoming for everybody visiting. Um, there's also other adaptive reuse projects. This is for the neighborhood fiber companies, similar condition, uh, makers of really unique Baltimore-based uh, products. In this case, the design was centered around this wooliness of the product that they develop. And um, a lot of the kind of the conversation, the visualization, and then the ultimate product at the end, uh, we hope will reflect who the, they really are. A few more slides of our work for nonprofit clients. This is the Maryland Food Bank. Again, retrofitting new uses into these kind of larger industrial spaces. Um, this houses both their operations as a major distributor uh, of food in Maryland um, and to various um, social uh, programs, as well as a food works education program uh, that uh, provides opportunity um, to, for training to young people. Another kind of humble warehouse in Baltimore now being converted to um, the West Baltimore Resource Center called now the factory, um, also in construction and delivering later, later this year, um, housing a bunch of nonprofit um, entities and serving as another major community resource. And then um, this is a, a project that's on the books, City of Refuge, um, operating out of Brooklyn neighborhood of Baltimore and really looking to expand their current operation um, to continue to provide um, social services uh, and education services uh, for the underserved community of Baltimore. Um, and this is a project that sort of uses some of the industrial heritage of Baltimore with kind of this low scale um, warehouse buildings around and kind of an introduction of a new typology of housing here, at least for our city and somewhat inspired perhaps by projects in the Netherlands. Um, the last few slides are a project that I want to leave you with that is extremely important to us. Um, this is another project that we intend to self-perform. It's a development design build. Um, but in this case, it involves um, the acquisition of one of the old Pratt Library branches in Baltimore. It's a building, again, that has sat vacant for, you know, let's say 10 years or more. Um, that's um, kind of in a state of disrepair that we're acquiring from the city and are developing into this idea of a community kind of resource of our own. This is something that our studio is gonna occupy um, alongside other entities and really start to develop this idea of how education and entrepreneurship and, and design can really start to coexist in this one space, but also be a little bit more out facing and become a public amenity at the same time. And um, the existing building is in the front on Ann Street that we intend to renovate and then build kind of the second structure in the back into the garden that really starts to function as a co-working and um, exhibit an event space. Um, and of course, the large green area. We're extremely excited about it. We intend to bring a lot of kind of these aspirations and studies we've done over the years uh, and use this site um, both as a testing ground, but also as a resource for the rest of Baltimore to engage in some of these ideas. 
Um, I'll stop here. I know that there's a lot of um, other interesting things coming from David uh, in the next presentation, um, but I, I wanted to lay out some of the um, ideas that we've been pursuing, some of the work that we've been able to do uh, in Baltimore, kind of with big ideas, but kind of executed on the smaller scale. Um, and I look forward to hearing David's thoughts, and then we can um, kind of check notes from that after that. Thank you very much, David. Please take it away. Um, right. Uh, thank you, Pavlina. And thanks for introducing me, Thais, and also for the uh, for, for having me on this webinar, Christina. Thanks for that. Um, well, I'm I'm looking kind of dark or blue or something. I don't know if there's something wrong with my camera, but I'll tell, uh, I'll start my story. Um, uh, well, I will. I'm always. I, I'm not. I'm not a designer. I can't design. I can't draw. Um, I'm always. I'm always just like wandering around the the city a lot. Um, and that's also what I what I my, I encourage to uh, my students to do. As well, the, the urbanism and the planning students I teach, as well as the social work students I'm with. Uh, also, to just be in the city and then you will notice uh, a lot of things and you really can capture and try to understand the city dynamics. And I'll tell you three the small stories. That's mostly what I do, tell stories about uh, things uh, and about three different uh, places in uh, or sites in, in Rotterdam. Um, so a small one and one large one. All right, uh, let's go. Uh, the first one, that's, that's, that, 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 that's, a small, that's a, a, a interesting one. And I think like 15 years ago, there, was a, there were some plans in the, in the city center of, of Rotterdam to, to build two huge uh, housing or yeah, housing or resident, residential buildings. Uh, one a very special one called the Martal, Emperor de Vey, Queen um, And the other one is just more a residential tower. I think the first plans were made, I think, in 2006 or 2007, uh, but the financial and economical crisis hits hard. So um, the, 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 the second one, that residential tower, couldn't uh, well proceed, but the Martel was established in, uh, in, I think, 2014. But what happened is um, that little, that little this, this site, that little space next to the Martel was kind of, well, lost or, or, or empty. But uh, the, 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 the municipality has, has shown some grass over there with, 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 with good success because people uh, really uh, started to use this, 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 this site, this, this, uh, this, 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 well, this, this plain grass field next to the Martal, which has also, it's, it's, it's like a food garden or food market with, with, with dwellings as well. Um, so it really started to, to, to come alive. Uh, although it's it meant to be in a, in, in just a construction site for a, for a housing project. Um, so it goes on and goes on and it really became something what we call a place. And I'm a geographer, I'm an urban geographer and place is one of our main concepts. So we talk a lot about places and we really are interested in what's, when some site or some space is a place. And yeah, I think uh, one, of, one of the uh, main geographers I've really uh, set up that um, how a space can turn into a place. And I think that's exactly what happened with this, with this site next to the Martel. Um, because what happened, uh, the, the, the people really start to use it, really start to, 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 to be there and to get like attached to it, we call it the place attachments. And they developed in a way, many citizens of Rotterdam, but also many, um, uh, many citizens of Rotterdam, but also uh, tourists and, and uh, people who, who, who are living are, who are living in the Martel really got attached to it. They developed a sense of place, as we geographers call it. But then the well, the, the, the economy was better, and the, the old plans of those of that residence, residential tower, um, uh, well, got some continuation, and it upsets a lot of people in the city petitions of as well the, the proponents or the or the or the the, the opponents and the proponents um, 
uh, got, 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 got alive and also in the city council, it was, a, it was a big discussion, big debate going on about that residential tower because people got really attached to this, to this site. It just became, as we say it, from a space to a place. So Persia, just the location, it was just like a material dimension, just, just a playing field with nothing on it. And then there came the activities. So that's it's like a new layer, the pragmatic dimension of it. And then slowly uh, it developed, we as a city, I think this developed a sense of place. We, 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 it's the symbolic dimension we had to this site. So from just a space, just an open space, the construction site it transformed uh, in quite, uh, well, just a yeah, little time, I think, into a, into a real place with meaning. With, with, uh, was very meaningful for, for a lot of people because imagine this 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 the city center of Rotterdam. It's it's kind of stone. It's 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 kind of gray. It's still car oriented. Um, so it was like a, a oasis. So it was like a green well green place um, with high value for for a lot of people. But as you already saw it uh, nowadays, the, the construction, well, the construction are gonna, I think uh, will start soon and this residential tower will be, um, will be built. I think just an example of, of uh, where we have to ask ourselves, um, sometimes it's something turns out to be something you wouldn't uh, have wanted yourself or it turns out very different or being, it redefines really, uh, uh, questions like should we build and just build projects and make well expand your portfolio and make more residential um, into area instead of investing in, for example, in the in our public space. All right. Um, second story. Um, I have three stories for you today. Uh, the second story is also a little you know, just, just a tiny site in, in Rotterdam, also at the edge, at the edge of, this, of the city center, and it's this one. You see the flag, it's a nice flag, it's a European flag and initiative of Ancora a long time ago. And this one is also, is, is an, I think, an interesting one because it just, for many people, it's just another plain gray site, right? Just just a piece of asphalt, large area, and stony too. Um, and next to it, where you see the, the, the trees over here, they, they, they have been building the last year's the, the pole building of uh, MVDP again, Mini Mass. Um, and with the, with the, with uh, it's now, it's finished already. Um, with this depot building, they also want to try, it, it's finished now with some trees on top. It's nice, some greening or greenwashing, how you want to call it. Uh, I think the last one. With, with this depot building, it's what is like a public museum, uh, kind of large sellable thing. They also want to, to reactivate the, 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 the park next to it. Also the, the, the part on the left with the, with, the, with, the, with the European flag on it. Could be logical because as I said, Rotterdam is, is, is that's a focus about being more green and more sustainable and more climate adaptive. So everything with large projects in the city about being, we we'll try to, to, to make the city more green. And this is one of them, the museum park. But what they really uh, so so they, they make like a, a, a also this is one of the, of the municipality and they also uh, invited uh, Gustav von, Gustav von Porter, a large uh, landscape uh, uh, firm, to to make like a new new design for the for the for the public space uh, sur surrounding the, the new depot building of MVDV, and of course to make it more green. I think it's a good thing. Well. Like I said, it's 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 it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a stony, a stony city center. But what I really forgot um, is this is the, the 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 value of this of this of this flag of this site. Um, and what happens? There are a lot of uh, there are a lot of lot of uh, people who are using it as a skate as as an urban spot as a urban for urban sports. For longboarders, for skating, for inline skating, for uh, uh, cyclists, dancers, even. So it's be used a lot by many people, and it's a very nice, inclusive place. The queer community, different genders, boys, girls, rookies, uh, professionals, they all come together at different times of the day at this specific site 
because it's well it's i don't know why but it's it's a, it became very uh, important and meaningful for them and of course they can't uh, do some urban sports with when there will be grass so what you see about this is um you have a huge iconic building i think it's it's a nice one it's a little bit like the, the chicago bean uh, a little shiny and glassy and and Verdeve has always very good marketing, uh, marketing and public relation uh, focus. And, 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 and so I think it's in all the design and art daily uh, sites, very Instagrammable, this building. But this, this side next to it, I think it's iconic too, because the depot building has called iconic since I think the first artist impression. I don't know why in, in Rotterdam, they always think buildings are iconic before it's built. It's strange. I think. To be iconic is a social construct, right? But I think this 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 site, this 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 playground for the urban sporters, what's very uh, very uh, democratic, very uh, plural, very um, wide, inclusive, uh, open, um, wide in the, in the link. Um, that's it, more iconic for the for the city than that depot building, what's all kind of shiny and uh, <laughs> it's shiny with all those mirrors. And that's something I don't know. I'm I'm always curious about. Does some the the designers or the does they miss it? Does doesn't they participate a lot or doesn't they um, uh, go out a lot uh, enough to really understand the social dynamics? To, to really understand what residents do in different sites, what, how they use it, so how what the value and what the meaning is they they they, 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 they are giving to, to 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 specific places like this one i think it's just lost and one of the activists of the of the urban supporters kim butter butter she 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 well she's now very active and, and talking to the tournament's penalty uh, fortunately it's a little bit late but she does it and she said something very interesting i think she said well sometimes you just have to not design you just have to 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 to, to leave it undefined Maybe we should do it. Maybe we should just leave it this way because it's it's working and it's meaningful for a lot of people. All right. The third, I don't know if I, if I have got any time left. Yeah, so it's the third story I want to tell you is about a larger part in the, in, in the city. Uh, it's called the M4H for M for H or Mara Fierhave. It's a port area. It's an old port area in the city. And I will tell something about it. Um, it's it's kind of interesting. It's 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 well, Rotterdam used to have a lot of port areas inside of the city, but uh, a lot of waterfront uh, development, and they always try to well, the 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 harbor of the, the ports activities are are moving out of the city, and they always uh, really um, uh, trans transformed those 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 port areas through a public private partnership. Port out, city in. There are a lot of a lot of new buildings and uh, high skyscrapers and all of that stuff. But in this one, they 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 in this area they, they they've chose, chosen a, a different uh, approach, a port city approach, resulting in a more like organic area development where port really meets city. Um, and they tried that uh, they wanted uh, it to become like a more vibrant innovation district with special focus on the making manufacturing industry. So it's, 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 it's a nice approach, I think, because it's really paved the way for like for the most in initiatives for some entrepreneurs, startups. And um, it's, 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 I think there's a nice dynamic going on of, uh, right now. Some port activities, but also some, 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 some new types of industry. Um, but there's some big worry, and that's, uh, that's also about housing. The worry is mo most about the residential function of this whole area. And the possible possible dominance of the housing, maybe high end housing, penthouses, and other uh, expensive stuff, because as as more parts of the world in the Netherlands, we also face a, a pressure on the housing market, high house prices, etc., uh, etc. Et so the good thing about this area, it's it's nowadays it's like it's it's like in between a port or in between a, a city area. The nice uh, of the the, the um, they haven't the nice thing is they haven't really built anything yet. 
you, you do have some artist impressions and I think it's suggesting that it will be fancy with wooden buildings and I think expensive. But the good thing is uh, there is some time and there, the city, the municipality uh, with the uh, major uh, harbor company together, they made up a framework, not a master plan, not, not, a, uh, not a blueprint or something like that, but really a, a, a spatial framework or some guiding principles, uh, like uh, give room to experiment, room for uh, uh, in, in innovative industries, uh, focus on the sh on sharing mobilities, on sustainable circular ways of of, 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 of of doing and of working. So it's kind of interesting that it's just a spatial uh, uh, framework, not a plan. Uh, what gives opportunity to, to do to do a good thing? It even got a logo and it's brand. It's, it's like a brand almost. And it did well. And nowadays there are some. Uh, artists and entrepreneurs and startups in this area active. It's, I think a very good thing, and they really, really, um, they really like have a have a, have a nice uh, atmosphere. Well, it's, sphere of it. It, it's it's like an uh, it's it's a lot of self organized collectives, communities, dynamics. They really uh, believe like in in the commons, in in the things we have together. They share each other knowledge. Uh, they co work, co create a lot. So nowadays, I think there is a lot of Good, good energy in this in this area. The food garden, but it's has multiple functions, um, and some some street art uh, is, is popping up. But that worry about those 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 big plans of the big designers and big high buildings of Star Architect or whatever uh, you name them, it's 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 still present, and that worry is is is, is getting bigger and bigger. But nowadays, it's it's the the the, the, the nice dynamics uh, social dynamics. Still existing uh, in this area, and please, uh, I hope it will continue along uh, for a long time. And these those initiatives uh, like this really paving the way for 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 a development we all want a very inclusive development. Um, and for that, and well, so you have like the 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 time to 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 develop. The development is going quite slowly, and I, I like it a lot. In favor of those uh, of, 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 the, of all the change and all the transition you want to make, there's still some space for those initiatives and for the for the entrepreneurs and the startups in the area. But the last thing is is it's 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 a, it's, it's a difficult one. I think it's to really uh, preserve the access to the area, to really to try to to make the, the development itself inclusive, but also for the rest of the city. It will be a city, a city, city district. That's that will be once. So please um, make it a part, a logic part, a logic element of the city of Rotterdam, and not by uh, building high-end uh, housing with uh, sky-high prices. And therefore, you have to go back. I think in the time. That's what I do as a research. I research a lot. It's just happening. And I always go first back in the time to see what what. what how it was once and it was just industry and industry and because of all those the, the industry of the, the, the i don't know those warehouses and dirty work i guess uh, brown industry um they they built the the neighborhoods surrounding the mpa area right now so they re just, just build those neighborhoods um uh, to to provide housing for the for the workers in the harbor in the port in the harbor and in you, when they went to, to, to the soccer game at Sunday, they could just smell and see always the harbor. It was very close. They were very connected to each other. The, the ties were very strong. You, 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 you lived in the area and you walked every day. They work, walked to the, to the MVR uh, area. Or you passed the, the, the dike or the bridge. And uh, it was very close, close to each other, the surrounding areas. And at MPA. So now the days, the, the the municipality and also big like real real estate uh, uh, developers, uh, they really well they see I think a lot of uh, dollar signs uh, when they look to this area. Um, and but we, I think we have to prevent like the short term profit taking and really try to 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 not just focus on this new vibrant uh, energetic area, that MPA area. Um, with, uh, but to really to get 
the, the surrounding uh, the surrounding neighborhoods involved. Or maybe we should even focus more on the surrounding neighborhoods than on the MPH area itself. And by doing so, you you also uh, you also try to to really uh, to, to 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 make this new part accessible um, for the residents in the in the surrounding neighborhoods. And you have to know the surrounding neighborhoods, as a lot of residents were facing were daily and daily basis facing a lot of social uh, economical uh, struggles. Uh, it's, it's a very vulnerable uh, 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 population. Over there. And there are some problems, but um, I think we do have to, to, to address them a lot. This area is, is surrounded by a dike because it's, it's, it's a port, it's, it's lower than, than the surrounding neighborhoods. So there's a huge barrier, um, a dike, or it's, it's very high also. So all those uh, residents of the surrounding area, when they look at the MPH area, they don't see it because you just see like the green wall. Uh, what's what's between the, the surrounding areas and the MPI area, the new area. But they really have a lot of yeah, ideas and they really try nowadays, and I encourage it a lot, also my students who are working uh, in this area, really try to, 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 to co-create and to, 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 to get all these people involved and also a voice because access to a city is not just a physical, um, um, a phys physical challenge, um, but it's also an institutional challenge, right? You also have to be um, really part of the decision table to really and to really try to 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 manage as a resident. It's a pity that it's like this. That but to really try to 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 be part of the decision making and part of the development of that of that MVR area because nowadays the the or the the the, the fear of the fear I have or the worries I have. Is that this area will just be like a real estate thing, just really be a, a, a place where architects and designers can can expand their portfolio and build huge buildings. But please, uh, for everyone, really try to ex uh, ask yourself the questions like we are really working for. We are you uh, how to work with citizens from scratch on really try to make this city district not just a, a, play, a site for the happy few or like a gated community with high, high end housing, but to really make it a part of the city, which logic and what suits the city as well. Um, so that's our the three, uh, I see Thais already, uh, this is three stories I want to tell. One, but really trying to say how um, uh, as, as just a plain site with some grass can transform very quickly from a space to a place and be very meaningful for people. Uh, the, the second one about like the free space next to the depot museum, um, what is so important, what is so, uh, I think, valuable for, for some groups who are also kind of vulnerable in our city. Uh, and you shouldn't just uh, redesign it, or maybe you shouldn't design it at all, just because you want the city a lot of uh, some, yeah, more green. And the third story about really that's to try to understand the communities, to try to understand the social communities of the entrepreneurs and the startups in the new area the, and the, the inhabitants who have very strong ties and very strong connections with the old harbor in the surrounding areas and really try to, to, to get all parties involved in the planning and in the development process uh, and not just design because it's nice to have the high, high skyscraper at the end of uh, close to the waterfront. All right, that's it. Uh, thanks for your time. Thanks, I think uh, it's, uh, it's all yours. Yeah, thank you so much, David and uh, Pavlina earlier. Um, we're, we're running a bit out of time, but um, uh, we're still good to go for another like 10 minutes or so. So uh, we're not in a rush. Um, so please uh, stay with us if you, uh, if you want to. Um, there was a question from, um, uh, from the audience already earlier, just after Pavlina's lecture, um, and I, but I think it really applies to both your lectures, um, although maybe on a different scale. Uh, the question was that, um, what the reality of producing projects like Broadway, it was about project Broadway markets. Um, was the reality of producing projects like Broadway Market in underserved neighborhoods in Baltimore, for example, neighborhoods with many vacancies or low-income residents, and and what are the challenges? Um, 
with these projects in these type of areas? Yeah, thank you for the question. It's uh, it's it's an ongoing conversation, but it's also um, I, it's something that I didn't get to share when showing Broadway Market was that Broadway Market was developed first, yes, in a very developed area of town, although the immediate surroundings were struggling, but it was strategically developed by Baltimore Permit. Uh, public markets in an area that they knew already has um, kind of a captive audience and that the project will more or less succeed as designed, but the idea was always to use it as a testing ground and then be able to replicate it in other communities in Baltimore. So we did also work on the uh, renovation of the Hollins Market neighborhood, um, which is uh, the Hollins, Hollins Market and the Hollins neighborhood, uh, which is a completely different socioeconomic um, kind of condition and there are no four grocery stores surrounding that market so for many actually that is the only source of fresh food um, of meat and vegetables and things like that so I would say that the the main challenge there is really understanding the people for who you're designing for uh, and uh, knowing that the idea and the concept both um, design-wise, but also um, in terms of a business kind of plan, needs to adapt to serve those. So naturally, that particular market was designed kind of in a more conventional kind of old school market way where there was still a lot of prepared food, but also a lot of um, kind of existing vendors that were really the livelihood of, of that neighborhood. I would say from an execution perspective, the challenge we hit a wall with was really COVID because uh, it hit the project in the middle of it. And it's really hard to tell to what extent it was really COVID and the uncertainty of what was happening with retail at the time, um, or that it was simply the challenge that in a neighborhood like that, you don't know if you're gonna fill up all of your vendors, but the project didn't get executed fully as initially uh, designed and part of it were some of those uncertainties, uh, but still the transformation that happened there um, is tremendous. And um, it really functions also not only as a place for food, but also a place for gathering as we sort of paired it with one of our design for distancing interventions that is now this parking lot that was converted into this event space that the market opens up to. So in many ways, we were able to connect the dots between different projects and different interventions to make it work for that community as well. So yeah, the challenges are always there, uh, but understanding the people that you design for and having you know kind of the players that make the decisions equally committed to making it work is key uh, when there's a will, there's a way. Uh Thanks for, for the answer, Pavlina. Um, and I think, David, also the question could be um, also addressed at the, I think, the development of the M4H district, where I think you showed also the map of the new developments is always drawn with the, the borders of the, of the, the water, the dike, that's a, uh, as a, at the borders of the area, while actually on the other side of the dike, that's where the old neighborhoods were that used to be where the people working in the harbor were living, so traveling by foot across the dike into the um, into the harbor. Um, do you see that in the developments in the M4H district, this connection between the old neighborhoods and the the, the new uh, Halton happening to be district uh, is, is is happening, or is it still a challenge there? Um, yeah, fortunately, I do see it. And on a small scale, there are, are really great initiatives and really great ties and connections and, and, uh, and like exchanges between some uh, people in the surrounding areas and, uh, and uh, new makers uh, in, 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 the, in the new MVH uh, area. So on a small scale, yes, it's, it's already happening and they, 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 they are, well, they, they found each other or some of them did. But it's really uh, like a niche or it's really something just uh, happens on a very small uh, uh, scale, almost uh, invisible for many. Um, because when you really try to understand uh, or you really uh, at, uh, looking like at the at a decision table, decisions tables of, of, of the development and also of the, of the housing ideas and of the, uh, the, the planning instruments and the planning uh, 
um, how do you say it, uh, uh, terms and planning uh, uh, itself. Um, it's just some stakeholders, and the stakeholders are, in my opinion, are almost never residents. Also, my students think about stakeholders always about big firms and big agencies and investment companies, real estate uh, <laughs> parties, and of course, governmental parties like the municipality and the, and the harbor company. Um, but the city, the residents itself is never a real stakeholder. Uh, it's just one party who have some, some like nice, <laughs> Uh, nice ideas and and, and 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 that's a pity and i think and that's also what i what i'm seeing uh, nowadays at the uh, in order in order than yeah this area unfortunately sorry my sound was off um um speaking about the the, the, the stakeholders and the developers i think also in the mv4h area you can see a lot of um architects are also or artists uh, are acting as as project developer but then not as project developers that actually not per se bring social value but more as like traditional project developers that make tower what i actually took from um, from the lectures of pavlina and it's kind of in the end of your lecture uh, so it's kind of hidden but i think the last project you show it's where you are also acting as a developer but then not as like a commercial real estate developer or like but really like uh, uh, public building, developer for public buildings. And I think that's uh, the city of Rotterdam um, uh, could learn a lot actually from that. Uh, so how do you develop public buildings? Um, so, so is that a common practice in, in, in Baltimore or maybe broader in the US? Thank you for the, uh, the question. My interaction is not at all. <laughs> A common practice. We're very much going into uncharted territory there, which is what makes it so exciting for us. Um, we had a spirited discussion with our councilman <laughs> that represents our district in terms of what it means to have a public building. His perception was that while there's no public funding in this project, this building should have access to the public at all times completely on the dollar of whoever's investing in it and maintaining it and running it and all of that. And somehow public is public and therefore it should serve the public in a way. And we're like, well, okay, we can do that. You know, where's the public investment and the public money into that? I think it's really important to start to further that notion of what a public building really means. The vision we have um, is something that it is a, a private entity and a private development that has a entirely public oriented focus. It becomes, um, it becomes the ground for public activity to happen, but not in the way that retail does that. I want to be very clear that a shop is not a public space just because it opens its doors to the public to come purchase something. This is more along the lines of opening it kind of to the public to really activate and energize it through a, a lot of different programming. Now you have to be extremely creative on like, how are you gonna pay the bills, both on kind of the development side, but also on the operation side. And, and I feel like that's where really the creativity is coming into play here and kind of things that are really going to challenge us. And obviously we've talked about it and, and we've, we've, we've um, strategized around it because the design is almost the easy part here. Uh, I think making a model like that work and make it work sustainably and successfully um, is like the tough nut to crack, crack, but I feel like it will be transformative, not just for Baltimore, but as you mentioned, for other projects and other entities uh, who are able to pull this off. Um, thanks, uh, Pavlina, and I think also that your answer kind of is a bridge to to another question that came up in the in the Q and A, um, which is a bit broader, I guess. But it's uh, the question is like, how have you in your work, and more broadly, how can designers catalyze the force and interest that, uh, interest that are acting in the cities from all these different sides of the spectrum, and, uh, and 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 acting also in different directions, and and how can you kind of make sure that they have a positive impact on, on the development of cities. Um, David, you want to give it a shot? Yeah. Yeah, it's a difficult one. It's a very, it's a good question. Uh, I think an ongoing question. 
Uh, it's really, it's, 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 yeah, it's, it's, it's a difficult one. I try to answer it. Um, I think the first thing you have to do is to really take them serious, to, to really to, 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 to take all, all those different uh, actors and different uh, uh, views and, and perspectives on the development very, very seriously. And not just to, 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 to use it as like a, a box you can check up. Um, I have two types of doing of the two, two uh, short uh, I think examples to how to, uh, I, I handle this. One is to go, and this was something I, I, I teach my uh, students to make a narrative mapping. And that's something, it's, it's, it's very nice. I just go with like uh, uh, some sheets into the neighborhood and it, they ask to the residents to, to draw maps to really tell um, how they walk uh, to, their, to, their, to, to, do, to work or how they, uh, they, they, what are the places they, uh, they, they visit a lot um, in, in their neighborhood. And that's, it's, uh, uh, I think, a nice, very uh, easy way to, to get like in, to, 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 to catch the, the perspective and also the way people use the city and use their own neighborhoods. And the other uh, uh, example I was thinking about, um, I think some years ago um, at my university, we started a, um, a study, a large uh, research project uh, on students with dis disabilities and well, interesting, etc. But what we did is we, we asked the students with disabilities themselves to formulate our research questions. So um, instead of uh, <laughs> formulating by our, uh, as, 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 as researchers. Um, so I think you really have to start from scratch in, in the neighborhood themselves, run around, ask people what they want and really take it serious. Uh, yeah, thanks, David. Um... I would like to interject one second. Yeah, sure, yeah, sure, sure. Uh, about designers and uh, the the problematic of programming, right? The client asks you for something, you need to uh, either brainstorm with the design with the client in terms of what kind of program is most suitable, or the client comes in with the program, or we solicitate as architects or designers, we solicitate a program and we sell it to the city or to a private. Now, you, uh, David, especially spoke about those desirable areas, very attractive areas, very meaningful to the people. And you also spoke about the designer that sometimes is very ignorant about how people, which we also are, right, as designers, use the space. And sometimes there is this disconnect of how the space is really used and how the designer either doesn't program it or over programs it or programs it in a wrong way, therefore takes, taking away this aspect of. Um, I don't know, uh, inclusion or identity to the space. Where is the fine line though? Because as designer, we are asked to program. You cannot, especially if you're teaching in, at the university and you see your student presenting some plans some site plans or some buildings and you go like, but what are you going to do with this space? You need to program it. You need to control the spaces otherwise. Where is the fine line of programming in their controlling the space or allowing the space to be uh, fluid, to remain free for the initiative of, of, of the people, the citizens of the, of the, of the city. Uh, that's a question for me, right, Christina? <laughs> Pavlina uh, can always yeah. answer, of course. Please, uh, please, because it's an experience. It, yeah, it's a big question. I think it also for a designer will be very, uh, I think, kind of hard when something like turns out to be something you wouldn't have wanted yourself or you have you, you haven't uh, designed uh, so it will be i think a pity to to, to, to see that you do your your program is well i don't know maybe you just have to, sometimes you really have to dare and not uh, define too much not program too much uh, even if, if if it's the it's the if it's um what the client wants um you have the well. I think you have to to help me with this one, Thais. Um, in Holland, okay. we have a, a word, and that's uh, only van der I don't know how to translate it, Thais. Um, I have no it's, clue. <laughs> sorry, I, it's like a bypass, right? It's a yeah, shortcut. it's like a bypass. It's a short. Yeah. It's a shortcut. Yeah. Yeah, it's a shortcut in a in a like in a in a, in a, in, a, in, a, in a area made by people. 
And there is one architect, I think he, he also designed uh, a, a large, uh, large uh, field somewhere or large park, or I don't know, site a lot of grounds. And he just um, waited until the people decided where the paths should be, what is the more, most logical uh, way to walk through the through this site. And after that, he, he started designing the real pathways. So sometimes you just have to sit back and watch, I guess. Maybe I can give an example with uh, with one of our projects. It was in the case of the Broadway market and the whole area in the front. Um, we had a really hard time <laughs> convincing the neighborhood that they should let go of the 10 cars that can park there and allow that to be a space for people. Um, you would think that in a neighborhood that is historic, that is tight-knit and everything, everybody's of the existing residents, first priority was where would cars go? And there was even one of them who was like, one day you're gonna have to choose people. It's gonna be people or cars. Um, it was a very heated conversation, but it, I'm just listening to you saying people should decide this and this and that. And I don't think it's that simple. I think there's sometimes a very naive attitude when it comes to that because people are diverse. They have different interests and they represent different constituencies. Um, so that was one example of that. And even when we managed to convince them that this won't be a parking lot for 10 cars, but it will be a space for people and a public gathering, um, then we wanted to design it in a way that was very flexible. So you see sort of like the gravel and the planters and you can pull out tables, you can have a craft market there. It was sort of always envisioned to be something like where they can evolve over time and, you know, sort of give the market time to live and then see. That was really the intention behind all of it. But even then the neighborhood would say, no, it has to be a, a brick paved plaza or nothing. <laughs> and again, having to test these preconceptions of like being okay with something that is temporary, temporary indeterminate and allow for things to continue to evolve and kind of live into their next self. Um, so I completely agree with you on that. I think there needs to be flexibility into programming and it happens on, and it needs to happen on all levels, kind of the client architect. And I'm sorry to burst that bubble, but the public as well. Um, I think people need to also take a little bit of education into sort of the fact that the city isn't exactly what it was the last 10 years or even the 70s when you first moved into this neighborhood. The city had this long life of 200 plus years. And if we all do the right thing, it will continue to live in that sort of way and continue to evolve. I think that's the one thing I constantly have to put in perspective when we interact with communities of like, yes, we're here to listen to your interests, but I also ask you to sort of look at the bigger picture and kind of this continuity of time and how we all fit into it. Um, lastly, I will mention on this subject of um, kind of public input and people deciding kind of what happens into space. Similar things happen with, kind of housing. We've been involved, obviously, on all sides of it. Um, and oftentimes, when sort of new housing comes in the neighborhood and you meet with the community to really hear them out and really have a good discussion, a lot of the discussion is happening from people who already live there. Uh, and yet, you're designing something, or let's say if something's getting redeveloped in Remington or another area that is expanding its kind of residentship um, and is looking to attract new residents. I think there's an inherent conflict there between those who already own houses and maybe half for the last 20 years and those who are yet to come and live here. Maybe they weren't even born when you bought your house. There's like, there's again, this sort of time and space continuum that somehow collapses every time you have a public discourse, discourse and people, fail to see this other side. Um, and yes, sometimes maybe developers and architects are self-serving and they just wanna like expand their portfolio and make a bunch of money. But a lot of times also they build things because the so-called market needs it, which means, you know, increasing the tax base of the city means bringing new residents into it, finding out who those new residents would be and what their needs are and what's the way that they want to live in. Many times there's like solid kind of data and research and programming behind it. I will agree with you 100% the devil's in the detail, right? Mm -hmm. So there's so many different ways to really accommodate that more organically, more sort of grassroots wise, 
And so far, you know, in being engaged in all of these different modes, and I haven't found the perfect model at all. <laughs> so that's why you're showing three different stories of like, what if this and what if that, and maybe it's all three at the same yeah. time. Uh, I think it's important to sum it up. I think it's important. You said to take it seriously. I would add to that is to keep an open mind. It's extremely important. And that includes empathy when it comes to everybody involved, no matter what their constituents base is uh, and sort of understanding of all of these different point of views and an open mind for the possible solutions. Maybe it helps for as a designer, if you're like really committed to an area Right, like you're doing really with one side. You not just build something and move on to the next project. Yeah. yeah. Um, there are two more questions from the ones that haven't been answered, and I will leave one for as a kind of a, the last question because it's open. But I think the the uh, one of the questions that came in, um, maybe David, make me can answer it. Um, it's about the. The policy making and and <clears throat> and the financing of public space in Rotterdam versus Baltimore and Pavlina, you already said something about Baltimore. Um, in Rotterdam, uh, David, does the city have like public funded programs to actually purchase and uh, create uh, these kind of public spaces or buildings and and to to develop them, or is it up to the private sector? Um, I think it's the. Uh, I'll it's just public space I think by the government, right? I don't, I, I can't, can't think of an of a project what's like private funded in the, uh, uh, an open space was private funded. No, I can't. Uh, the public uh, spaces uh, are all, I think, from the municipality over here. Right? I can, answer, <laughs> I can answer, I can answer maybe a bit. Uh, there's one, currently one project uh, being crowdfunded. It's a, it's a public building. It's called that, oh, uh, yeah, like, that, that palace, sort of like the neighborhood palace. Yeah. Uh, it is a current, like it's a building that is currently in occupation by like neighborhood initiatives. Uh, they set out a crowdfunding campaign for like, I think they managed to get like 650,000 euro in crowdfunding. Um, but somehow the policy uh, the yeah, it's acting like a private party, right? So that's, yeah. that's, I think that's, that's the difficult in, in, in Rotterdam. Yeah. I think the municipality is, is, is public, but it's, it's, it's really acting like a real estate. Mm. What about so the that. Zeus project over the, uh, toward the north from uh, Hof, uh, Hofplein? Oh, the, the bridge. Liching, the Hof Park. Yeah. yeah, that's, that's yeah. also crowdfunded. And also from, well, like the, I think the, the, the municipality is, is giving room for, 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 for people like this, um, architects and um, crowdfunding, uh, but it's still, uh, they always have a big role. They're playing always a big role. And it just depends on what what version of the municipality you uh, have in front of you. And sometimes are the, the, the welfare uh, guys and they're very nice. And sometimes it's just more the real estate types of the municipality and they have a very different perspective. So that's, I think, a huge problem in Rotterdam. It's all public, but it had so many different faces and perspectives on how to deal with public space. Thank you. Ties to you, the last question. Yeah, I the think... last question, which is also <laughs> a question that came from the audience um, before we wrap up. Please, please answer briefly. And I think it's also, it's maybe the most difficult question, but also maybe an easy answer. Um, what would be like your favorite project, um, whether it's in Baltimore or in Rotterdam or I think for an architect, it's the, the most difficult question, right? I have two easy ones. Okay, cool. <laughs> well, I think the question is, what would be your dream project? So I understand that it's something that hasn't happened yet. Um, I think uh, that's how I intend to answer it anyways. But uh, there's two projects that I'm really excited about that I don't even know if they're going to happen, but if they do, I'm on it. <laughs> One of them is really rethinking what I pointed out earlier as the, as the 20th century inner harbor uh, portion of the city. It's something that worked in the 80s and really 
um, helped Baltimore kind of get through those next few decades in terms of a vision for what a city is. And it has largely sort of decayed and died. And we don't yet have a vision for what that looks like in the 21st century. And I think it's an extraordinary opportunity to bring energy back into the city and uh, to, you know, kind of continue to think very hard and very, <laughs> very open minded way about what that could be. So that would be one of my dream projects. The other one would be removing a portion of the highway that divides our city into east and west and has probably single-handedly done the biggest damage from a social and urbanistic perspective uh, over the last 50 years for the city. And um, I think there's extraordinary opportunities uh, in rethinking that quarter uh, and kind of turning it into somewhat of a more human-centric artery rather than a car-centric one and allow the city to reconnect from east to west side. I think it offers not only kind of design and urban design kind of green frontiers in terms of thinking about what that could be, but also I think it would allow for some of the underserved communities in the city to start to integrate um, a bit more. I think both of those projects are sort of watershed moments for the city and I really hope they come about. Christina is hoping with you. Yeah, uh, David, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if David has a project in his mind. Yeah. No, for the MVH <laughs> area, I'm, I'm really hoping that all the, like the, the people in the surrounding neighborhoods who once worked at the, at the harbor really try to really get like free spaces close to the waterfront to really connect with the water again. Um, and I hope those sites will become real places, not over-designed, but just free spaces for, for people to be and enjoy the city and its water. Beautiful, David, thank you so much. Um, yeah, it's time to wrap up. I wanna thank all the, um, all the speakers, Pavlina, David, for sharing the stories with us. Um, it was really interesting to, uh, to hear your stories, but, and also to have the conversation going on, on different values in the city, who has the agency, how do you address that agency, how do you um, make the design press, uh, process accessible for all these different users of the city, basically. And, uh, um, and I think that's, that's a great lesson also we can learn from, from well, from David as a non-designer, uh, you already started apologizing when you started your lecture, but I think it's, uh, you shouldn't apologize. I think we should apologize as designers, especially I think as Dutch designers that we have no clue how to actually talk to normal people. Um, but um, so I think we learned a lot from it. And also from the projects uh, that you showed, uh, Pavlina. Actually, I really want to finish my dream project currently working on is quite similar to one of you, it's, it, to your last project. It's um, the trans. Uh, it's it's the transformation of an old old bowling alley from like nineteen eighties. That's completely run down. It's squatted to together with the squatter to actually turn it into a neighborhood cultural center. So I learned. Uh, I will look more into your projects, and uh, uh, it's really interesting to see. And I hope at one point we can maybe meet in Baltimore, um, like in real life. Uh, would be very interested uh, in, in that. Um, I want to thank uh, Christina for all the introductions and for organizing this and really wish you all the best for the next uh, uh, yeah, lectures in this series. And Rachel, you're not in the screen, you're somewhere hidden uh, behind the screen, but thank you so much for, again for organizing everything and you know being really uh, strict on, on, on the technology and stuff. Uh, it works out really well. And uh, thanks you all for, for listening. And uh, I think the lectures will all be online available to, uh, to watch them again. So. Absolutely. Uh, this is what we want, right? This combination. So Pavlina, Thais, David, talk with each other and maybe something will spark. And definitely, uh, Thais, you will, be, you will come to the Baltimore because we do have a connection. So sure. Pavlina. David, Ty, thank you so much for putting the human center topic in this lecture up on front. 
Thank you for the amazing work that you are doing. Audience, thank you very much for being with us. Good afternoon or good evening, whatever you are. Please tune in next Tuesday. We're going to have another exciting conversation between Megan, which I see in the audience, Elkat from Present Company, and Elina Karanastasi from Ex uh, Architects in uh, Rotterdam. And it's going to be moderated by Tonya, uh, Tonya Sanders from Oregon State University. It's on the 8th of March which rings a bell. I have three women lined up on the 8th of March. Not bad as a coincidence. Please keep yourself uh, tuned with the event guide because all the information about this recording will be there. And thank you again for, your, for sharing your knowledge so generously. Have a nice evening. Thank you all so Bye. much. Bye. Bye. Thank you.